Uh, thank you all for joining us and a warm welcome to our very first seminar of the Aphasia CRE seminar series. My name is Caroline Baker from La Trobe University and I am co-facilitator of the seminar series alongside Michelle Attard who joins us from the University of Sydney and our centre manager Kelly Massahill here at La Trobe University also. Can I just check, Michelle, that you can hear us? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you. So today we are thrilled to have a welcome address by our director, Professor Miranda Rose, and a presentation by Chief Investigator, Professor Leanne Tor. We've done our best to test run the technology for today's presentation. So please be patient and bear with us as we use technology across multiple sites. <coughs> Uh, 56 Zoom links to individuals and groups of people from all parts of Australia and even internationally. We are really excited to have over 100 participants with us today. Well, that's what we are hoping for as people join in. Um, we have groups of you gathering in rooms from various health networks and universities. We also have many of you attending from your office or your home. And we are recording this seminar and it will be available on our website um, in about a week's time if you'd like to refer back to it. Wherever you are, we warmly welcome you. Uh, firstly, we'd like to encourage you to use our Aphasia CRE website. Here you'll find more information about our team, projects, activities and resources. If you haven't already done so, please join our community of practice via the website. This means you'll be kept up to date with the latest information via emails, invitations, and a monthly newsletter. You'll receive invitations to our upcoming monthly seminars. So don't miss out on the details of our next one, which will be in August. As you may be aware, we are active on social media, so please engage with us on Twitter and Facebook. Thanks everyone. We're very pleased to be hosting the first seminar here at the University of Sydney. And um, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Leanne Tor, a speech pathologist and professor of communication disorders following traumatic brain injury at the university. Leanne's no stranger to CREs. She's been um, involved in the clinical CRE for aphasia that began in 2009 and um, was the chief investigator for the CRE uh, called Moving Ahead in Brain Recovery. As Miranda mentioned, today Leanne is going to be discussing the research program that she leads within the present aphasia CRE. My pleasure now to pass over to Leanne. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, and welcome everybody. So we have some people here in the room and I believe we have numerous people possibly all over Australia, hard to know. But wherever you are, thank you for, for tuning in and for our very first um, CRE webinar, which um, is a little bit of a milestone for us, I think, as a CRE. It'll be the first of many, again, many of these webinars, uh, because we're doing so much amazing, wonderful, work and uh, we're all extremely excited about that. So today what I'm going to do uh, is just give you a brief introduction. So I'm not planning to talk for more than about half an hour. Um, just of the what we have in our current plans for the, um, the third program that's outlined in the CRE. But it's by no means going to be all that we do. I think we're right at the beginning of this story and I think there'll be many other projects that will come out of this particular program of research. Uh, I would like to acknowledge Rachel Redake uh, and Emma Power um, for, for some of the work that I'm going to be talking about. Also Melissa Brunner um, and John Pierce. John Pierce has helped us with the slides um, kindly, so um, for the CRE slides. So just to, to kick things off, the CRE, as Miranda mentioned, is a 
large collaboration across a number of universities and it extends nationally but also internationally and it's led uh, out of uh, La Trobe University by uh, Professor Miranda Rose uh, and luckily we have a wonderful um, interdisciplinary group of researchers who are working together to to try and solve some of the problems of aphasia, rehabilitation and recovery. As Miranda said, um, just to, I just want to reiterate one point out of this um, sort of vision statement that we have, and that is that we're going to transform the health and wellbeing of people with aphasia um, but it's, and their families. But particularly today, we're talking about um, enhancing current services and thinking about how can we make things more cost effective and sustainable and interdisciplinary uh, and really focus on equipping things to meet the needs of, of these people and their families and right now I don't think that we we do have a very good um, set of models of care to serve people with aphasia and their families especially those who are um, not in um, big cities or close to specialist units. As Miranda said, we are interdisciplinary and we are resting our research on a foundation of a series of uh, um, areas such as, you know, with a focus on implementation science. These are sort of almost cross-cutting themes across the work that we're all going to be doing across all programs. And as such, these elements uh, will also come into program three, which is about technology. We just move on to talk about what traditionally happens in rehabilitation pathways um, now. We have this sequence of events. Somebody is admitted as an inpatient into a hospital um, where they may or may not stay for very long. They're discharged to an outpatient service then uh, may be able to engage in some kind of community um, rehabilitation. And then ultimately, many of the people that we're dealing with are discharged. I've put lines across that sequence of events um, between inpatient and outpatient, and then between outpatient and community, because these are risk points. These are where people can drop out of the system altogether and we can lose them. So we know that transitions between these phases can be extremely um, risky and problematic and people can be lost to our services altogether. So our traditional models of care really are not fit for purpose, um, sadly. And we have this, this idea of this disconnects in the change, chain of care. Uh, and this is for not only for people with aphasia, but for people with acquired brain injury more broadly. Um, we know that demand on healthcare services are increasing, and this is because of increases in population growth. Our population continues to age, and we, uh, as a result, there are just increasing pressures on the healthcare dollar. And because of that, um, in some cases, there's a decline in services, um, particularly for in the primary healthcare community service provision areas of um, healthcare provision. And in some uh, circumstances, there's a complete absence of services. And this is a huge problem because we, we know, and it's been recommended in the, um, the Stroke Foundation Clinical Guidelines for Stroke Management in 2017, Specifically, that stroke rehabilitation requires this highly coordinated and developed systems of care, which may be needed across um, the lifespan. So we have a, a big mismatch here, and this is our problem. But as all problems offer us, um, there are opportunities in this. And so they, these are issues for us to um, address in a number of ways. And one of the ways that we're proposing in the CRE that we can address these issues is through technology and e-health. I thought it might be useful to offer a definition of what, uh, whenever I speak about e-health or digital health or technologies, people say, what are you talking about? And I'm going to draw on a, an excellent definition from a paper that I'm going to talk about a little bit in detail today uh, that was published um, 
by Melissa Brunner uh, and colleagues in 2018. And basically this, this definition really encompasses the complexity that we see in this particular area. So, um, and I think this is why people get confused by this area. So the first part of this definition is really look, talking about data, health data. Um, so electronic health, electronic health records, population health data, biobanks, um, outcome data, consumer generated data and claims data from insurance companies, for example. So there's all this data and, and people talk about big data and that's, that's one part of eHealth. Uh, there's another part of eHealth that's all about uh, informing and tracking health and wellness. And so the uh, proliferation of mobile dev devices, all the things we can get on our apps and uh, all the apps we can get on our smartphones and tablets, um, sensors, wearable devices um, to, to tell us how many steps we've done in a day, for example, uh, the use of social media and uh, things like Twitter and Facebook uh, and any other sort of online information, education information that's available, that also falls within the realm of what we would consider to be e-health. And finally, we've got e-health um, technologies which facilitate communication between health stakeholders and that might be between clinicians working in a team, but it also may be between therapists and their, and their patients. So things like have, being able, just having um, um, SMS text messages, push notifications from apps, um, social media platforms, and also through virtual and simulated therapy tools. And there has been some work um, from a number of researchers and, and clinics in terms of um, online therapy for people with aphasia. And uh, I'm thinking like one example that immediately comes to mind is the work that Leora Journey has done um, with uh, a number of platforms to look at helping people with aphasia perhaps do some more self-management of their um, rehabilitation uh, at home. So that's the definition. And then an, an easier way to, to process some of that information um, was put forward by a model that Tim Shaw um, developed in 2017. And he sort of summarised these things as e-health um, is health in the hands of consumers. It offers a, offers a way to put the power of people's health in their own hands through apps and, and devices and sensors. It also is about data, records, and what he called the quantified self. So, and there's a lot of work in the fields of pred prediction. You know, if we get a certain amount of data at a certain point in someone's recovery, can we predict, can we use that data to predict what their trajectory of recovery is going to be? Um, so data is used in many different ways. Uh, it's also used to provide provision, uh, precision healthcare. So genomics, for example, has, has grown considerably, uh, even since Tim put this together back in 2017. And then finally, there's this idea of interacting with and between health professionals and also with clients, I would like to add in there. So the idea is that all these three domains contribute to the final outcome uh, of, of a good e-health service, which is informed active consumers, prepared proactive professionals and an efficient responsive system. So, and keeping in mind patient safety, patient privacy, privacy of data, um, access, and that we're encompassing uh, research and education when we're, when we're talking about e-health. So I'd just like to pause for, for a moment, and this may um, trigger some ideas for some discussion. Um, and that is what, what are our workplace is going to look like in 10 years time. So I was at a workshop um, yesterday where we were talking about what life was like in clinics when we all started work and nobody had a phone. Nobody, or we had a phone on the desk attached to the wall. We didn't have computers. We didn't really have much technology at all. I was very, very proud when I got my first busy pitch because um, to, to, that gave me some way of giving biofeedback. 
um, of pitch changes. And so we really didn't have a lot. We had tape recorders, we had really old people amongst us, we had language masters that gave you, you know, immediate, you could, could record themselves and listen back to themselves. But there wasn't, it wasn't readily available. And I'm not that old. So this, 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 we've gone through a fairly radical revolution in technology, I would say, since I first started my clinical work. And so we were asked in this workshop I went to yesterday, well, what's, going to, what's it going to be like even in 10 years time or 20 years time? And there was one um, paper, for example, that suggested that by 20, 2030, which is just over 20 years away, 25% of the current activities that we're, we're doing will be automated. So technology will take over functions. So it, does make, it did make me think, well, which bit of speech pathology is going to be automated? Um, and what are the technological disruptors going to be? And how is that going to change what we do? What are we going to have that's going to help us with diagnosis, with predicting and, and recommending treatment, with doing the treatment? Um, will people come into hospitals at all? Will that be a practical thing? So they're just questions to think about. I did have um, one example of, of a, a fellow that I've been working with in the United States at the University of Kentucky, and he's developed um, a, a, an assessment tool um, where you, you ask a person to, to leave a voicemail message and the voicemail message gets recorded into the computer. It immediately converts from speech to text. That text can then just be quickly checked by the speech pathologist. Um, and we're looking for evidence of politeness markers. So when somebody leaves a voicemail, can they use politeness markers in appropriate contexts? Say if they're leaving a voicemail for their boss. Are they able to use um, relevant and the, the, the markers that we've, we're they're sociolinguistic markers, but we could be looking for anything. He's got a, a an algorithm that goes through that that text and quickly adds up how many politeness markers there are, and it gives a score. And what what he has found, his name's Peter Muhlenbrook, and what he's found is that um, that score can predict whether somebody will be able to be stably employed. So that all happens fairly quickly. You can do that within about 10 minutes. So, um, so that has, in my mind, transformed the whole process of what we would normally have done as a speech pathologist, which is record something, sit down, write it out, then analyze it by hand. Um, and then may or, you may or may not have known whether that would predict return to work or not you'd just think, oh, they're not going very well with their politeness markers. So I think the sky is the limit, really, in how we think about what are we, what are we automating and, and what, what questions are we going to ask the data to tell us? Uh, and I want, obviously, for them to be meaningful questions. The other question when we talk about e-health is whether we have the capabilities to use technologies in health service provision. Uh, are we teaching our students how appropriate levels of capabilities? Uh, uh, what is the a graduating student or an early, an early um, career uh, clinician, are they able to use technologies? And what are we wanting them to be able to do? So this, these questions were posed uh, and answered uh, recently, and uh, this was a, a collaboration across a range of uh, agencies. Um, Liz Brunner is the chief author on this paper. It was led by Tim Shaw as the senior author. There were representatives in this uh, study from a range of agencies, government agencies, um, at local, state and national levels. We had um, organisations like eHealth New South Wales, the New South Wales Health Education Training Institute, uh, and then inter it was an interdisciplinary approach as well. So health sciences, dentistry, medicine, uh, nursing, were all involved in this. 
And this was a, a, a three-phase mixed methods study designed to answer those two questions that I just posed to you. What are the capabilities that we should be um, teaching and expecting of our graduates and health professionals? And so basically, I'm not going to go through all the methodology for, in the interest of time, but there were um, 39 stakeholders who contributed to um, multiple phases that included focus groups, for example, and a Delphi consensus process. And what, what the sum of all that work was, were four key capability statements. And these were described in terms of knowledge and performance. So that um, paper is freely available. It's an open access publication in the Journal of um, Medical Internet Research. So I can recommend that to you uh, as a place to start. And really, this was trying to outline what are the foundation uh, levels of knowledge and performance that we need to be able to practice in a digital health environment. Um, so I think I've said the rest of that, but um, the, the final bit I want to include about um, who was included, it was ratified by the Ministry of Health in New South Wales as expected basic capabilities. So we, so this is what they want all graduates um, of all disciplines to be able to, to do. And so I'm just going to give a little bit of an, a little bit of a snapshot of the four, but not going into a lot of detail because they, they, it is quite a detailed um, uh, document. But things like digital technology systems and policies, so being able to um, understand, the knowledge statements were all about um, what we want people to understand and performance statements were about what we want people to be able to do. So from this point of view, um, for example, the knowledge was about understanding the range and purpose um, and functions of various health technologies so telehealth, secure messaging, web-based platforms, etc., And performance was in involved. One performance indicator was demonstrating the ability to access and navigate digital health technologies relevant to the scope of a person's professional role. Another capability statement was about clinical practice and applications. And I think a lot of the work that we're going to be doing in our CRE relates to this particular capability statement. I've just included some of the areas of knowledge uh, that were included in this statement. So web-based consultations, models of self-management, um, consumer-centred apps, patient portals. It's a very complex area that I think um, is underutilised at present. The third capability of statement was about data analysis and knowledge creation. So being able to use data and data analysis to inform, deliver and improve health and healthcare practices at individual team and systems level. So this is where a lot of the discussion about data, big data, being able to use machine learning um, comes in and also establishing intervention effectiveness, which is also going to be a part of, I think, a pillar of the work that we do. And the final uh, capability statement was about implementation. So uh, the experience I've had with developing digital health technologies in treatment, um, it takes you on a different path to perhaps other more traditional forms of research where co-design is critical from the beginning. You need to be sitting down with your users, you need to be looking at whatever it is that you're proposing through their, the lens of their perspective and getting um, direct feedback before you even start. So the other aspect is advocating for change. I think us as clinicians, as researchers, as professionals in this space, um, will need to drive change in this area um, and um, be a champion. We need to be champions and role models to enable others to use digital technologies. There are some people working in healthcare systems who, who um, are less able or, or don't, don't want to be involved with these kind of technologies. And then there are others who are very easy, quick adopters. So it's really about um, working out how can we promote change um, within clinical teams. So the program 
in the CRE we've entitled Technology for Healthcare Communication and Rehabilitation and uh, these are the core people who are included in the application. Um, so uh, myself, Emma Power, Annie Hill, Marcella and uh, Michelle Attart. And uh, as uh, Miranda alluded to in her introduction today, we, we have four programs of research. Um, sorry, we have four programs of research um, and they're all underpinned by these uh, principles of knowledge translation, standardised approaches to health economics, uh, technology aphasia, enabled aphasia research and we're going to be building an aphasia research hub um, which is very exciting but today I'm just going to focus on that bottom um, left hand quadrant of this diagram which is the um, five programs that we have so far within the technology for healthcare communication and rehabilitation program. So the first, uh, the first one that I wanted to mention is the Lift Home project. And uh, this is, uh, in this program, we're proposing the use of tele-rehabilitation to deliver all the components of the um, traditional Lift program that's come out of uh, the University of Queensland. And we're gonna be delivering that directly into homes. So that just shows some of the components of that program. And we will be comparing the language outcomes when delivering lift in the home via tele-rehabilitation against the standard in-clinic delivery of lift. So that's kind of the first major um, project. The second project is the aphasia app. And uh, this one comes out of La Trobe University um, aphasia affects the speed, ease and effectiveness of communication between patients and care teams, particularly when they're in the hospital um, and as they're moving through their care journey. So the aphasia app um, has been developed um, with key end users. So there's been quite a lot of preliminary work done, pilot work done to build this app. And uh, it supports the, the um, professionals who are dealing with that person with aphasia and that might be speech pathologists but it could be the physiotherapist it could be the doctor it could be the nurse so that the, the person with aphasia has this app and it is facilitating um, both the, the health professional and the person with aphasia to engage in their rehabilitation and um, have effective healthcare communication uh, the, the app is designed to accompany the patient throughout the transitions in their healthcare. So this is starting to address those lines that I was talking about in that first diagram. It's aiming to close potential communication gaps and improve patient safety and satisfaction. Very exciting. The um, third area that we're going to be looking at is communication partner training using e-health technologies. Most health professionals who interact with patients with aphasia receive little or no specific training for this task. And so we know that communication partner training is considered best practice. Uh, we have considerable evidence to support the use of this approach, but it is not routinely accessible for health professionals for a range of reasons. So this project is going to evaluate the effectiveness of an e-health uh, communication partner training program in helping professionals communicate in real life aphasia um, settings. And we're also planning to um, include in this project training healthcare um, professional students um, and in our universities. The, um, the next um, area of uh, work in, encompasses the recently published core outcomes um, that have been published by uh, Sarah Wallace in, and colleagues in 2011, in, sorry, in 2018. Um, so we know that a key element of aphasia management is valid and reliable assessment of aphasia. And uh, we've got these, these core outcomes now very usefully that were achieved by a consensus. And so this project um, proposes the validation of tele-rehabilitation um, service delivery 
of that research core outcome set. So one of the goals will be that, that we will have a validated set of outcomes by the end of the CRE, which I think you, you can sort of see we're, we're looking at some building blocks. We're looking at some foundational elements that we're going to need to build all our other research um, upon. We also um, uh, have started to develop uh, an online automated assessment um, program. And what that does is allow us to record conversations of people with aphasia and their partner. And um, it provides some automated analysis of the features that are happening in, in that interaction. Uh, so things like the amount of speaking time somebody um, who's what percentage of speaking time does the person with aphasia have compared to the partner? What's the turn taking like? And it also allows us to investigate some other um, social cognition um, features such as the person's uh, expression of emotion, their, um, how they're using their body posture during uh, online interactions. And so this is very preliminary work, but it's, it's going to be a very exciting addition to this program of research. So um, in thinking about what our digital healthcare pathway for aphasia um, rehabilitation should look like, what we want is not the inpatient, outpatient community and discharge track. What we want is being able to use digital health to identify early on uh, what, what we need to be working on, what the person's strengths and weaknesses are, and perhaps to be able to predict their future needs and build, build a program of um, treatment that is going to look at their more lifelong trajectory of what that person's needs might be to have personalised management that is tailored to their life goals, their strengths and their support needs. And I think eHealth has the potential to provide lifelong access to the specialised technologies that we, we um, can provide for training and support as it's needed. In thinking about what do people with aphasia and their families need and um, what's what's going to be important to them. It's having their own data, data going with you, continued opportunity to try new technologies as they arise and having the opportunity to practice if that's what they want to be able to do. And for clinicians, if we can um, create some treatments that a person with aphasia can self-manage with their families, there may be more, it may free up time to develop other community supports, other community um, services, it may offer the opportunity to provide more personal, personalised rehabilitation and to focus on that person's life outcomes, including their ability to have conversations, which is a uh, central part of the work that, that I do. So this is just a summary um, uh, that I, I think people with aphasia and their families should have access to. Their own protected data, they should have access to technological advances as they occur. They should be able to um, access treatment that can be provided online when it's needed or when it's appropriate. Um, there should be self-management options, um, ongoing provision of education about aphasia and its consequences. We know that that's important and it doesn't end when the person leaves the hospital. Being able to practice skills at a frequency um, which is going to enable neuroplastic um, and therefore long lasting changes. We want these people to have access to the latest technological uh, devices that may support their daily living, um, that supports lifelong rehabilitation, and that gives them the capacity to engage in learning and relearning skills. Everybody has their own personal recovery trajectory. And so um, I think at the moment, we can't have a one size fits all in terms of the models of care that we're offering. Um, just before I finish, I'd like to um, highlight some existing resources that um, have happened along the way um, with that on our digital health journey. There is now a digital health cooperative research centre. Uh, we have a number of um, 
investigators involved in this digital health CRC. Tim Shaw is the leader of the research component and he's here at uh, the University of Sydney. And that represents a $120 million investment in digital healthcare over seven years. So that offers us a lot of opportunities uh, to leverage upon that, um, that special opportunity. And uh, we've, we've already started working on how we're going to be able to do that. We also have developed a digital health and informatics network. And I encourage you, if you haven't heard of it, to please join. Um, we have, as everybody does, a Twitter um, handle. There are monthly newsletters. So there was a newsletter came out just a couple of days ago, um, which always has a lot of interesting information. And there will be a conference in Sydney in February in 2020, for example, called eHealth at Sydney. Um, which will also have a lot of papers, uh, a lot of cutting edge work in relation to digital health. So uh, I encourage you to go and have a look at the um, digital health and information, sorry, informatics networks website and register because then you just get some updates, you get information about what's happening um, as well as latest research. So finally, I think for us, um, to have informed active consumers, prepared proactive professionals and an efficient responsive system, we need to address these issues. Um, we have a disconnection between services. Uh, there is a serious lack of integration of medical information um, across phases of care. There's variable access to telehealth services at the moment. Uh, and this creates inequity and inefficiency at best and poor outcomes at worst. And I think that's the essence of what's driving the work that, that I'm doing, is to address this issue. To do that, we need policy change uh, to establish and enable the use of technology and data within and across services. And having that e-health capability statement process has been very useful in New South Wales, but I imagine that needs to be rolled out um, nationally. And we, don't have the online platforms currently to provide education and training and secure access to data, which is always extremely important, and secure video conferencing. So they're, they're some of the goals that we're focusing on developing as we proceed through this CRE, uh, which I, I actually think is um, very exciting. So thank you for um, attending. Thank you for the opportunity to present to you. That's my Twitter handle if um, you want to send me a tweet. But if you're more traditional, there's my email as well. <laughs> um, so I'm going to stop there. Um, and I believe we've got, we have question, question yes. time. Yes. Do we have questions? We have questions. We have many questions. Oh. We'll be moderating by a slido. <coughs> so thanks to everybody who's been engaging with that. So perhaps we can go through from the top down. We do have a few there, Leanne, so we've got lots of interest. Wow, so, okay, that's exciting. Shall I read them out? <laughs> yeah. I can read them out. Okay, great. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer them all, but <laughs> I can do my best. So the first one, given the importance of therapeutic relationship in current clinical practice, will there be any research dedicated to patient experience of or with technology? Um, yes, there will be. And I think that's a, an essential uh, component of any research that we do. So, for example, we've just finished a study here in the traumatic brain injury um, field where we measured therapeutic alliance um, of, so the, the patient and their family gave a, gave a score of the thera their views of therapeutic alliance on the Agnew relationship measure for example. So that was just one of our secondary outcome measures. The other thing that, um, the other approach that we've taken to, to deal with this is qualitative interviewing. So we've, we've always been able to build that in um, either during or at the end of a program, a, a project, um, which has included telehealth. And so um, I think all of the research that we're going to be doing, if there are patient if there's patient involvement, it will necessarily have co-design 
um, initially and then there'll be always the experience of the patient experience um, uh, of using that technology. I think that's critical. I think we've got to, we've got to do that, which is part of it. I hope that answers that question. When you finish with the question, you yeah. can give that tick on the green. Oh, that's okay. Beautiful. That's very exciting. <laughs> that gives one a great sense of achievement, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, that's lovely. Um, when will the aphasia apps be launched? What's special about the app comparing to the current aphasia apps available on the market? Um, I'm probably not the best person to answer these questions. Um, but I think a lot of the aphasia apps that are currently available on the market are treatment apps. So it's, you know, how to, how to do V-Nest using an app or how to do um, Silt using an app. So there's a lot of um, therapy-based apps. Uh, the aphasia app is really developed as a sort of an education tool and also a way to promote communication between the healthcare professional and the person with aphasia. So they have their own personalised um, um, kind of AAC resources to facilitate to, to facilitate um, communication um, and also the information about them that they can take through once they leave hospital, they've got information about who they are and what their um, what their rehabilitation is. Uh, and that's about as much as I know about that one. So I don't think, can Latrobe people talk? Are you there? <laughs> yes, we're here, Leanne. We have Marcella. You are there because I can't see any, I can't see. Um, yeah. Was there anything else? Is Marcella there? Because it's really... Yes, Marcella's here. Baby. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, yeah. Jill, I would just add to that that I guess that there is, um, there's no shortage of healthcare apps um, on the market. And there's sort of a sense of fatigue around apps. Like there's an app for everything. Mm -hmm. So we've been very careful in how we've developed the app that we have developed it um, alongside stakeholder perspective um, and we're testing it. Um, so we did a very small pilot of the app last year and, and learned lots about the app and lots of things that we wanted to refine on the app. Um, so we've just gone through quite a major revision of the app and it's gone back out um, for testing. Um, so in terms of when it's going to be launched, we're holding off until we've got some um, data that it's usable, that it's useful, that it's relevant, that this is something that health professionals tell us, oh yes, it's, it's doing something above and beyond what we can do without it. So once we have that data, we'll be happy to share it um, but we're just, we don't want to add another app to iTunes until we know that it, it's actually worth it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, I think. So we're not talking this year, in other words. No. Are we? It'll probably be next year or maybe even the year after. Let's say next year. Next year. <laughs> All right. We'll be, we'll be. I mean, I think that's um, worth just reminding everybody that we're right at the beginning of this journey. So this is all planned research. Um, so a lot of it hasn't really got off the ground yet. We're really just um, providing an overview of what we um, want to do. Um, and, you know, we're very keen to get people involved, which relates to the next question, which is what is the scope of this research? Mm -hmm. Which I'm not really sure. There we go. And collaborate. Are you planning to expand and collaborate with other aphasia researchers lo located in other countries? Um, the answer is yes. Uh, we do plan to be collaborating with people, obviously around Australia, but also internationally. And we do have international um, experts uh, in the CRE. We're going to be building our community of practice. Uh, and so, and we invite you to, to join that. So uh, we're really opening this up so that we can include 
as many people as possible and that community of practice will not be limited to Australia. Uh, you know, we'll be, we're, we're all collaborating with people from other countries already, so that would continue. Mm. Yeah. Um, how can we find out more about the automated assessment of interaction content? That sounds really interesting. It is really interesting and it's, um, it's based on some tr preliminary work that's been conducted through the Faculty of Engineering and IT and the Faculty of Medicine here at the University of Sydney. Uh, it has not been trialled as yet with uh, uh, the discourse of people with, with acquired brain injury at all. So all the work's been done looking at how, how do doctors, how, how can we train doctors to have better healthcare interactions with their patients. And so we're adapting this program and it's in a prototype version at the moment and we're trialling it actually with an honours student um, this year. That data will be um, available by the end of this year. And then we're also hoping to trial it with, with people with aphasia. So there's really not anything around on at the moment, it hasn't been used in this context at all, but I think it's got quite a lot of promise. And it is really interesting. <laughs> um, how do you feel that CBOS and university curricula will need to be updated to accommodate this rapidly changing landscape, um, technology landscape? Uh, well, I think, I think we're, we're trying to deal with it now. Um, in what we're doing, what we're teaching. It, I think we need to be incorporating, uh, it, it, it would need to be included in CBOS. I think we've done those e-health capability statements and this um, led that substantial, substantive body of work and everybody wants it. So I think we've, that's what, we, if we're gonna deliver graduates who are going to fit into the, the current healthcare context, I think we need to be incorporating that. Ooh, yeah. Stopped again. Yeah. We had a flurry of questions. Oh. It's great to see how engaged everybody was on Slido. So thank you for that. And I think we might wrap up there. So thank you so much for attending our series. And um, there is a Pulse tab on the Slido app if you'd like to um, give us any feedback about the experience or any requests for future speakers. Thank you so much, Leanne. And it was a pleasure. Time. Thank you. Thanks to everyone for, for attending. Thank you. <laughs> it was great. I wish I could see you all. Could see you all, but um, it was it was great. Thanks again for the drive. Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>